there. So firstly, hello everyone and welcome to our for fourth guest lecture of our Food Safety Week 23 today. We are very lucky to be welcomed by Sonia Van Dijk, a key account manager for market access at MSD and My Health, what is a leading pharmaceutical com company in the UK. Sonia has been with MSD for over 10 years and has a wealth of knowledge on animal vaccines. As our theme for today of animal vaccines, our aim was to introduce the link between healthy animals and safe, consistent meat products in which vaccines play an important role in maintaining. Farms imp implement vaccination programmes produce animals less likely in contracting common diseases, which can result in poorer carcass performance, excess trimming and a lower carcass yield. These are all elements that are very important in our production sites and demonstrates the responsibility that our farmers take in supplying us with quality stock. Today, Sonia will help explain what animal vaccines are, how and why they're administered to animals, and most importantly, how they are vital in optimising animal health, welfare and food safety. And with that, I will now kindly pass over to Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, and good afternoon to everybody joining this presentation, wherever you are within the Door Meats and Dumbia company. Um, I'm very honoured to be part of your Food Safety Week, and I know that you've heard from some very eminent speakers this week, so I'm super excited to be joining them as one of your guest speakers. Um, as Claire said, I'm from MSD Animal Health, one of the leading animal health pharmaceutical companies. And I'm going to talk to you today about vaccines in livestock and the role they play, uh, not only in health and welfare for the animals, but also in food safety. My role within MSD is to engage with retailers and, and processors and advise and implement preventative animal health projects within the food supply chain. So firstly, I'm going to explain to you the differences between three commonly used medicines which are administered into livestock destined for the food supply chain. I think uh, within the farms that we work with, there is some confusion on farm um, as to what each of the medicine groups does and what they're commonly used for. Um, so farmers will commonly refer to jabbing the animal. That's the language they like to use. Um, but I'll give some clarity in this slide as to what each of these groups of medicines are and what they do. Um, so to start with, antibiotics or antimicrobials. So antibiotics and antimicrobials, these are treatment medicines and they are used to, to try and cure or reduce um, and limit disease. Um, they do this by either killing or halting the multiplication of the pathogen or disease that's attacking the animal. They do this at a cellular level by either killing um, or halting the multiplication of the disease and they disrupt the cells of the pathogen that's, that's in question. What they don't do, however, they will not prevent disease from happening or protect from future disease. So common antibiotics that you may be familiar with are penicillin. So penicillin, as we all know, um, is, is used in human medicine. Uh, and alamycin is another example of an antimicrobial. So antibiotics, antimicrobials, they usually have a withdrawal or a withhold period once they've been used on an animal. And we'll come on to that a little bit later as we work through the slides. One thing to note about antimicrobials and antibiotics is that they will only treat bacterial infections and not viruses. So this is why if you go to your doctor with a sore throat or a cold, um, he won't prescribe you antibiotics, or I hope he wouldn't, um, as it's more than likely going to be a viral infection and will self-cure within time. If he does pres prescribe antibiotics, it's doing so irresponsibly. And unfortunately, that is going to contribute to antimicrobial resistance. So this is why antibiotics are being prescribed less and less. Um, and doctors are targeted to only prescribe them when absolutely necessary. So the next group of medicines we're going to move on to is NZs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And again, NZs or non-steroidals, they, they are a treatment group of drugs um, and they work to reduce symptoms. So they work by preventing prostaglandin being produced and it's the prostaglandin which creates the inflammation. So in essence, NZs reduce swelling, discomfort and heat. 
If they're used early enough at the first signs of disease, they can have an effect. So sometimes we'll see a calf lying down in its pen with its ears slightly down, slightly floppy, and they can be administered an NZ. And what can happen is that the animal can start to feel better. So the temperature goes down, um, there's less swelling, a little bit less heat. So the animal can feel well enough that it's able to start feeding and drinking again. And this can enable the animal to fight off the infection itself, because by eating and drinking, it's going to gain strength again. And hopefully, you know, this can, this can reduce the needs for antibiotics because the animal will feel strong enough to fight the infection off itself. So examples of non-steroidal non-steroidals can be finidine. So the active ingredient of finidine is flunixin. And also, um, if there's anybody horsey amongst you, phenylbutazone. So this is uh, another name for phenylbutazone is bute. Uh, this is usually used in horses um, and it cannot co come into contact with the food supply chain. And the third group of medicines we're going to talk about on this slide is vaccines. This is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So a vaccine is a biological product which when administered into the body it provides immunity against the imitated disease. So vaccines prevent disease from occurring by remembering the disease it's been vaccinated for so that it can recognise it in the future. Vaccines are not a treatment. So it can protect individual animals, but it can also provide herd immunity if all animals in the herd are vaccinated. And we'll come on a little bit more about this later. Um, and vaccines can prevent against both bacterial and viral diseases. So from this slide, you can see how important vaccines are to reduce the use of antibiotics. If an animal is not getting sick in the first place because disease is prevented, then it won't need the treatment. So how does a vaccine work? So as I alluded to before, a vaccine is an imitation of a naturally occurring disease. So it's made from either an altered version of the natural disease or a man-made synthetic safer form imitation of the disease. So the preparation acts as an antigen. An antigen is a foreign substance which induces the body to raise an immune response by producing antibodies against the perceived disease and it destroys it. And the body is really clever in that its immune system will then remember the disease it's been fighting against and when it encounters that disease or a similar disease, the body will immediately produce antibodies to destroy the disease. So in essence, what a vaccine does, it provides the body with its own little army to fight off any disease that it's been vaccinated against. Do we have any questions, Claire, yet in the chat? No, there's been no questions yet, Sonia. Um, I think we'll do a Q&A session at the end yep, um, if fine. there's none coming through yet. That's great. So within the livestock sector, there are two main types of vaccines that we use. There are live vaccines and also inactivated vaccines. So live vaccines are made using a much less aggressive form of a natural disease, which doesn't induce illness. Um, the benefit of live vaccines is that you usually only need a single dose of a vaccine, a live vaccine, to induce a really strong immune response. And then we find that we need to booster these diseases for these diseases with the same vaccine, either six, month late, six months later or 12 months later, depending on the vaccine. Conversely, an inactivated vaccine is made using a synthetic copy of a disease or a killed version of the disease. So it's perceived by some to be safer because it's made from an inactivated form of the disease. And what we find with inactivated vaccines, because they're not as strong, we need a two dose primary course to induce a strong enough immune response because the vaccine is weaker. And then as with the live vaccines, we usually administer a booster um, at either six month or 12 month intervals 
depending on the type of the diseases it's um, protecting against. So all vaccines need to be kept refrigerated at the right temperature, usually between four and eight degrees. Our strap line is strive for five, because if you're at five degrees, you can't really go wrong. Um, if the vaccine is stored at the incorrect disease, it can change the molecular formula and this can make the vaccine um, less efficacious. So it won't work as well or if at all. So in the next two slides, we're going to look at how um, live vaccines and inactivated vaccines perform once they've been injected and why um, a live vaccine only needs one dose and why the inactivated vaccine needs two doses. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the differences. So this first slide is looking at live vaccines and this graph, it, you can see on the x-axis that it shows time, not in any particular <clears throat> scale but you can see time along the bottom and then on the y-axis is antibody concentration. So with a live vaccine as I stated before you get enough of an immune response with one single dose and you can see the dotted line along here is your margin of safety and the level of which the body must be protected against disease in terms of concentration of antibody. So once we put our first dose in we can see uh, that around two weeks after that dose, the animal has mounted a sufficient immune response to protect against the disease. So as we go along time, you can see that that immunity levels off slightly and then you get a relatively long plateau before it starts to decrease uh, in time. Uh, it remains at a sufficient level um, until about 12 months and within that time we give a booster dose just as it's starting to fall off and then you can see after the bo booster dose um, the immunity level comes back up to a safe level to protect from disease. So that's our live vaccine and in this slide I'm going to show you um, our inactive inactivated vaccine. So again, along here, you can see the dotted line, which represents the minimal amount of protection needed. So when we give our first dose, you can see that we get what we call a primary immune response, which takes us just over that margin of safety, and then it drops back down again. It doesn't give us enough of a lasting immune response to give protection against the specified disease. So with these vaccines, as I said, we need to give a second dose, usually between two and six weeks later, to further prime the immune system to give us a stronger response. So we can see that in this example, after two doses, the animal has been mounted a sufficient immune response to protect against this particular disease. So the level of immunity starts to decline again, which again, like the live vaccine, necessitates a booster at 12 months to bring that immunity back up to a safe level. So that's the difference between live and inactivated vaccines. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the different routes of vaccination. Um, Vaccines are licensed with the VMD, so the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, and each of these vaccines and any medicine actually has gone through trial work and the license is given depending on what the trial work has done. So for all of these vaccines, intranasal, intermuscular, subcutaneous and oral vaccines, they've all been licensed based on trials where the vaccine has been administered this way. So within livestock, we use four main routes to deliver vaccine. So intranasal, these are used mostly for respiratory diseases. And as the name suggests, the vaccine is squirted into one or both nostrils in the nose and an immune, an immune response is first mounted in the nasal membrane tissue. So automatically, once this vaccine is taken hold, which is very quickly in the case of intranasal, um, 
the pathogen load within the nasal cavity um, is reduced uh, before the pathogen gets into the rest of the body. So this is a very efficient route for a respiratory disease vaccine. Next, we come on to intramuscular. So intramuscular vaccines usually injected into the fleshy part of the neck or the rump um, because these muscles are rich in blood vessels. The vaccine gets into the blood and around the body very quickly. Our next route is subcutaneous. So with this route, the vaccine is injected and dispersed under the skin and into the fatty layer that sits below the skin. This route gives a much slower release, release rate as there are fewer blood vessels sitting in the fat when compared with um, an intramuscular injection. So you get a much slower, more constant release rate. And then orally. So these are similar to the intranasal vaccines. The immune cells in the mucosa of the digestive tract are activated first, and this enables the mucosa within the gut to fight the, effect, the infection before the pathogen crosses over the mucosa. So that's the reason we give these, all, these vaccines this way and these different routes. So just some vaccines, do's and don'ts um, when we're administering vaccines. In every box of a vaccine, there's a data sheet. Uh, it's really important to follow the data sheet because these have got all the details of how much you should give, where you should give it, when you should give it, um, et cetera. So it's really, really important to, to read the instructions. Um, so it's really important to vaccinate animals when they're clean and dry, because if you get a, a load of sheep in or a load of cattle in when they've been out in the rain and their coats are dirty and wet, that's when you can induce um, infection. Uh, if you're injecting the skin um, in these conditions, it can be quite catastrophic for, for some of the animals if they get an infection in the injection site. Again, for similar reasons, use a clean needle and syringe. Um, there are often syringes and needles lying around farmyards which get used over and over again. It's not good practice because the needle goes blunt. Uh, you get rusty needles, dirty needles, and again, you can induce infection that way. So storing the vaccine correctly. I touched on that in my previous slide when I said it needs to be stored um, in a fridge. Most of the time, um, the instructions of how and what temperature it needs to be stored at will be on the data sheet. Um, and at MSD, we have we have a, a helpline uh, for people to bring if something hasn't worked as they think it should. And sometimes we get farmers saying, oh, well, you know, I injected my cows with this vaccine and it hasn't protected against this disease. And one of the first things we do in that situation is go out on farm and look at the fridge. And you'll be amazed at how many fridges on farms are not working correctly. And that's usually because they've got a brand new kitchen uh, fridge in the kitchen, uh, which is the kitchen fridge had been there for like 15 years and that fridge goes out on farm um, and actually the fridge isn't keeping the vaccine cold enough. So that's a very common problem that we find on farm. Um, another thing that happens is that the farmer will go down to the vets to pick up his vaccine and on the way back thinks he'll call into the livestock market to catch up with his mates and have a cup of tea and he'll leave the vaccine on the dashboard in the Land Rover in bright sunlight and he'll sit in the market for an hour and then he'll go back and put his vaccine in a fridge but of course because it's been outside of the uh, optimal temperature again that vaccine is is not going to be working correctly so it's really important about storage and temperature storage equally it's really important to use the correct amount of vaccine we all know farmers are watching the watching the pennies all the time and they'll go oh, well we just put a little bit extra and we might get another five doses out of that bottle of vaccine but as I explained to you before the way these uh, vaccines have been licensed you know we know that that animal has to have five mils of a particular vaccine otherwise it's not going to get the right immunity and putting four mils in is not going to do so it's really really important to use the correct amount of vaccine. Again, completing both doses of our primary course, as I illustrated to you before, 
you know, we do two doses of a primary course for a reason. Again, a farmer might think he's saving money by not putting the second dose in. But as as you saw from my graph, if you don't put the second dose in, you're not going to get the right level of immunity to protect against that particular disease. So completing both doses is really, really important too. And again, injecting into the correct site and the correct route um, for the reasons I showed you on the slide before, you know, it's licensed to be given by that route for a reason. So it, you really do need to adhere to the data sheet when using vaccines. So they're the do's. <laughs> the don'ts are don't vaccinate sick animals. If your animal is sick already, it's not going to be able to uh, get the right immune response because it's already being compromised by trying to fight off whatever it's fighting. So you won't get the same response um, if you vaccinate a sick animal than if you vaccinated a healthy one. So sometimes you can use two vaccines together, but only if they're licensed to do so. Um, and if they're not licensed to do so, it's because the work hasn't been done in the trial to prove that these vaccines a, will work together and B, are safe to use together. So unless it's licensed to do so, do not use more than one vaccine at the same time. Don't keep and use leftover vaccine to save money because nine times out of 10, it's been out of the fridge too long for it to work. Um, and vaccines are only good for a certain number of days after they've been broached. Again, that will be on the data sheet. And as I said before, don't leave vaccine in your car. So who do we vaccinate? Who should we vaccinate? I think over the last two to three years, we've been shown why vaccination is important. I think COVID really showed us that vaccination does save lives. Um, and when I was talking about herd, herd immunity earlier, I think most of our population is now vaccinated against COVID. And we can see how this herd immunity has protected everyone by not only preventing us against contracting diseases but or, or COVID, but also it's lowered the overall infectious pressure of the virus within the population. And this is a really, really important factor of vaccination. So the diagram I'm about to show you um, will will tell us how each of the different species have been vaccinated and how each species has a standard vaccination protocol against certain diseases. So if we start flicking the diagram. For humans, so apart from COVID, when we're born, we all know that we have an expected series of vaccinations and then these are continued through childhood. So things like polio, measles, rubella. And because of these vaccination programmes, there is little evidence of those diseases in the modern day. And then if we move on to cats and dogs, similarly, when they're born as kittens and puppies, <clears throat> they get their vaccines before they go to their new home. So things like parvovirus and kennel cough. And then the horses as well. Um, in order for horses to go out and compete, they need to have had flu and tetanus vaccinations. And then we move on to the pig and poultry sectors. So historically, these are produced um, for supply chain in a much more integrate, integrated way. And this means that they are produced under contract by big suppliers. So everything is reared in exactly the same way to give consistent outcomes often with one owner across multiple units. And so with pig and poultry, there's also a standard vaccination protocol. And we find that vaccine penetration in pig and poultry is around 90 to 95 percent. So this means that 90 to 95 percent of the animals reared within pig and poultry are vaccinated. And similarly with aqua, so salmon, and our fish farms in Scotland and the Nordics, again, with two or three big players, have a standardised vaccination protocol. But when we look at the ruminant sector, so cattle and sheep, 
Things are managed much more on a farm by farm basis and with many different protocols and vet, many different vets advising different things. So in the ruminant sector, vaccine penetration is on average about 30 to 35 percent. So we can see that standard vaccination amongst the ruminants isn't as high as it is within the other sectors that we talk about. Sorry, Sonia, before we proceed, um, we just have a wee quick question um, yes, coming sure. from Paul Nolan. So his question is, with regard to medicine use in Ireland, um, is it necessary to record doses in medical register? Yes, it's really important to, to, to register what you're doing, not only so that we can see the, of what what each animal has had, but also for a record for the farm and also the vet so that we know what, what medicine has gone where. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So why should we vaccinate? There are many different reasons, and I'll take you through some of those now, but ultimately prevention is much better than cure. Once an animal has been diseased, we know that it's never going to perform or be as productive as an animal that has not encountered disease. So ultimately, we vaccinate to prevent disease. As I've just said, once an animal is diseased, it will never be as productive. So disease not only affects the animals, but it's very costly to farmers. So you've got to pay for medicines prescribed by the vets as treatments. You've got to pay for vets bills. On top of that, you've got lost productivity and you've got withhold times, which I'll come on to a little bit later. But ultimately, you know, if your animal is not as productive, your animal is going to be on the farm for longer before it reaches target finishing. And you've got to feed that animal and house that animal for longer. So preventing disease means less antibiotic use, and that can only be a good thing. Because animals shouldn't suffer disease if there is a vaccine available. And I think within the industry, health and welfare is becoming much higher on the agenda. Rightly so. Ensuring safer food. And non-concomitant disease. So this means no associated disease. In other words, if an animal is diseased, it makes it susceptible to contract other diseases as well because the immune system has already been compromised. So it leaves it exposed, really. And then we know that core vaccination, so core vaccination we talk about means um, vaccinating for endemic diseases. But we know vaccination um, increases productivity it enables better health and welfare. It goes a long way to contributing towards antimicrobial stewardship, because if we're not using those antibiotics in animals, we can we can make sure those anti antibiotics are, are conserved for human use. Lower carbon footprint. If animals are reaching their target weight quicker, we know that that animal is being much more productive in fewer days. So that animal spends less time on the planet. So lowering the carbon footprint is also um, something that it contributes towards. Improved profitability. I showed you the losses in this in this um, last slide about, about how disease is very costly. Um, less disease incident and overall future proofing livestock production. And all of this, of course, supports one health. So if we're taking care of our animal health, that in turn will take care of human health or help to take care of human health and environmental health as, as well is really important. So if we're doing the best we can in animal health, it has a knock on effect to everything else as well. So I'm just going to go through some vaccination penetration rates and we'll look at cattle to start with. So on screen here, we've got uh, three main diseases for adult cattle. So we've got BVD, which stands for bovine viral diarrhoea. Now, this is a very debilitating disease. It has an effect on fertility. It has effect, an effect on disease being passed to the calf that's in utero, which then in turn, if it's born, is a hooching disease for everything else in the herd. So BVD is really important within our sector. Um, current penetration rate is 42%, which for such a, a uh, destructive disease is pretty low. Then we have IBR, 
IBR stands for infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. This is a respiratory disease, so you can do it intranasally, as you probably have guessed from my previous slide. But um, IBR is a disease that stays in the nerve endings of a, a cattle. It's a, it's a bit like a herpes virus. And so in times of stress, so when a, cat, when a group of cattle is being moved or calving, you'll find that this latent infection becomes live again and the animal starts hooching disease. Um, so again, really important disease within the cattle sector, but again, a very low penetration rate. And then we've got leptospirosis. So um, this is called this is caused by a, a spirochyte, something which lives in watercourses. It affects fertility. It affects yield. Um, again, very debilitating disease. And again, only thirty one percent penetration rate. And when we look at calf pneumonia um, and enteritis, these are for calves. These two diseases, their main uh, problem is in calves. Um, we can see that for calf pneumonia, we've got 40% penetration rate and enteritis, or in other words, scour, of which 99% of farms would see scour. Um, we've only got a 90%, 19% penetration rate. So you can see when I was talking about pig and poultry being at 90 to 95%, the ruminant sector is very low and we're trying to do things to improve that. And then we move on to sheep. So Clostridial and Pasteurella is probably the most widely used vac vaccine in sheep. Um, so Clostridial covers things like uh, pulpy kidney, watery mouth, tetanus, um, and Pasteurellosis is a bacterial disease that affects the lungs. So they're the most commonly used um, vaccines. Then we've got foot rot. Um, foot rot is a disease that occurs within the cloven hooves of the sheep and causes lameness. And I would say I would bet 95 percent of farms would have seen foot rot on their farm. But you can see it's only 13 percent, the vaccine penetration rate. And then we've got the two abortion pathogens. So we've got enzootic abortion at 41 percent and toxoplasmosis, which is at 26%. So you can see we've got a long way to go to get those figures up um, to the equivalent of the pig and poultry sector. And this is where NOAA have come in. So NOAA is the uh, National Office of Animal Health, and they're the regulatory body for animal health uh, within the UK. Um, and they have come up with a vaccine guideline um, which basically says that their belief is that all uh, ruminant livestock should be vaccinated um, against endemic disease. Now, endemic disease means that it's a disease that all UK livestock are at risk from. And what they have done, they've, they've um, recruited three authors to write the guideline for each of the sectors. So for dairy, we've got a very prominent key opinion leader vet called Jonathan Statham. So he's written the guidelines for, for dairy cattle. Fiona Lovett, who I think was a speaker for you earlier in the week, she's authored the sheep vaccine guideline. And Joe Henry, another prominent vet, he has authored the vaccine guideline for beef. And what the guideline is looking at is it's more about treating at a population level, not at an individual farm level. So when we looked at the vaccination wheel, you could see when we talked about COVID that tackling disease at a national level means that the infectious pressure is lowered. So the thinking is that if we tackle these diseases at a UK population livestock level, then the, the vaccine prevalence will be much less. And really, we're changing the narrative from why should I be vaccinating to why aren't you vaccinating? So they would like vaccination for these particular diseases that I'm going to tell you about um, to, to be a default position rather than just a few doing it and a few not doing it. So for each sector, the guidelines have been split into two categories. Category one livestock vaccinations would be for endemic diseases for which all UK livestock are at risk from. 
and category two would be best practice. So this would be to address specific diseases at farm level. So i.e. The, the, the diseases in category two are not endemic. So they're not they're not across the UK. So the NOAA defined categories for core vaccination for sheep in category one, they'd be looking at clostridial, so tetanus, black leg, pulpy kidney, as I described before, foot rot, so addressing lameness, both of the abortion diseases and pasturella. And then ORF, which is a skin disease, would come in as a category two vaccination. And then on the cattle side, we'd be looking at the ones I named on the, on that um, high high charts. The, so BVD, bovine viral diarrhea, infectious bovine rhinic tracheitis, leptospirosis, scour, pneumonia, and clostridial. And then for category two, you'd be looking at lungworm and salmonella on a farm by farm basis. So now we're going to look at withdrawal times um, and food safety. So as I explained, whenever a drug is used, it's uh, licensed by the Veterinary Medicine Directorate. And there is a potential for any drug that's used in um, the food supply chain. There's a potential for drug residue to be consumed by humans. So the VMD has set legislation to set maximum residual level for each licensed medicine. And this is calculated by the number of days it takes for the active ingredient of each medicine to be metabolized and excreted by the body or the body of the animal it's going into to an acceptable and harmless level of residue. And this will vary for a variety of active ingredients. So the MRLs are set based on the drug being used as per the license. So the right amount in the right species and the, and the right uh, level. So if a drug is used off license, this means the license has not been adhered to. So such as a drug being used for a different disease to what it's been licensed for or for a different species of animal than it's been licensed for or a different amount given, then there's a safeguarding measure in place called the cascade. And this means that any medicine that has been used off license has a withdrawal period of seven days for eggs and milk and 28 days for meat. So edible tissues and food products can include muscle and liver, kidney, fat, skin, milk, eggs, and even honey. So with vaccination, there's no crossover and no withdrawal period. So obviously, if you've got withdrawal times, then the cost is going to uh, be taken up by the producer. So for dairy, milk's got to be kept out of the tank for a set number of withdrawal days. So that affects milk and cheese and yogurts. Um, so for meat and fish, animals can't be slaughtered until the withdrawal period has passed to make that safe to eat. And eggs, again, eggs must be disposed of until the withdrawal period has passed. So if a farmer has to withhold milk until the withdrawal period has passed, he, he gets no payment for the milk that he's had to throw away. So for meat and fish, if the animals can't be slaughtered until the withdrawal period, then he's got extended days to slaughter. So he's got to feed those animals and house those animals for longer. And for a farmer who's got to throw his eggs away, he doesn't get any payment for his dumped eggs. So overall cost of disease, you've got vets, treatment medicines and labour. You've got loss of performance, extra days to reach target and you've got withdrawal times because of product wastage. So all of that mounts up to quite a significant amount for a farmer. So benefits of vaccination in livestock and carcasses. 
So some diseases in livestock can be zoonotic. So zoonotic means that it can spread to humans. So diseases such as salmonella and leptospirosis, amongst others, are zoonotic. And what vaccinating can do is it can help protect against the transfer of these diseases, which means that vaccinated animals can then safely go into the food chain without any withdrawal period. Carcass rejection or partial rejection can result from diseased animals or those that have got parasitic infestation. And this not only means loss for the producer, but also for the processor as the saleable yield has been reduced. So that is the end of my slides about vaccination. But what I am going to touch on now is two projects that um, I'm running in conjunction with Tum Dumbia. So we've got two um, projects going. One is with sheep um, and that is looking at category core vaccination. So what we have within these projects is 12 producers. They're all based in Wales producing lamb and the project started at the end of last year. So what we're looking to do is implement all of those vaccines that I listed as category one vaccinations um, and follow the performance of these lambs being born from these sheep. So looking at productivity, antibiotic use, um, performance and reducing levels of lameness as well. So the first vaccines have gone into the sheep in this project and I'm really excited to follow them for the next two years. And the second project that we've got going is looking at suckler herd beef. So we started with um, five suckler beef producers in Yorkshire. This project started in 2021 and we've implemented category one core vaccination in both the adult herd and the young stock herd. And we're following the uh, crop of calves through to slaughter. And again, we're measuring performance, antibiotic use and productivity. So again, really excited to share the results of that once we conclude the project. So that's it from me today. So I'd just like to thank you all very much for uh, listening.